So uh, 39 years ago, almost to the day, a little bit longer than 39 years ago, you started the Vanguard Group. Uh, Jack Bogle, one of our heroes at The Motley Fool, for so many different reasons, which will come out hopefully in our conversation. I mean, it starts with simplicity and clarity, integrity, and a solution that is transparent in a financial industry that works so hard against those qualities, it seems, many times, it seems. So what was life like for you in 1974? Can you paint a little bit of the picture of what Vanguard was then compared to what it is today? Well, sure, and uh, it, this will not be very surprising to anybody that's ever started what we call in the modern age, didn't use the term then, a disruptive technology. <laughs> 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 and uh, we were shrinking. We had about, when we, when we finally broke up the Wellington Management Company into certain operating units, and Vanguard took over the administration, uh, we were going downhill. One of the directors said, Bogle, do you realize we're hemorrhaging? Realize that we had money pouring out, more money going out than, than coming in for 83 months. Hmm. So you've got to be kind of blind. You've got to be kind of stupid. Uh, and you've got to think that it's great news when a month's cash flow goes from $20 million out to $19 million out. <laughs> Everybody condemned uh, the index fund. Uh, Ned Johnson said, uh, our shareholders would never want a fund with average performance. Mere average. And by the way, that was the year 1976, probably, when all the Fidelity funds had fallen out of bed and they weren't getting anything like average performance, by the way, just for the record. and. Uh, and for whatever that, uh, I don't know, philosophical bent was on his part, nice enough to say, they now have a $150 billion index fund business. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this huge swing. Mm -hmm. Help stamp out index funds. Bam, 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 that big Wall Street poster. Mm -hmm. uh, everything was negative. Uh, the Wellington Fund had been about destroyed by, by our um, partners from Boston from an investment standpoint. Fund drop, that was our kind of the flagship of the Vanguard fleet, uh, dropped from $2.1 billion to $400 million. The performance was the worst in the industry for any balanced fund. There wasn't a lot of good news around. All the funds that were part of the merger went out of business. Ivest Fund finally, funds that people had never heard of. The dustbin of history, we say, fund called Technovest, using technical market analysis, yes, Wellington brought out such a fund, mm. and a fund for trustees called Trustees Equity Fund, the first one, and uh, it crumpled mm. like tissue paper in a fire, mm. <laughs> <laughs> to, to pick a metaphor. <laughs> so everything was bad. You had to know you were right in the long run. You had to know the gross return in the financial markets minus cost equals net return. <laughs> pretty smart here. <laughs> That's the underlying principle. And you also, this is, and I didn't really phrase it this way in those days, Tom, but uh, when you think about it, we're all indexers. Every investor in America is an indexer because 25, 30%, let's call it 25% is indexed, but the other 75% own the index, but one at a time. I mean, that's the total market. Mm -hmm. And if you have the total stock market fund, you either own it as a unity, or you own little chunks of it, mm -hmm. and somebody else owns the rest. Mm -hmm. So will, will the unity, let's call it the unity business of the index fund, do better than the trading business with all these other people that own the index trading with one another and try and, and, try and out, outpace them, which of course can't be true. Mm -hmm. And they pay their little helpers. Mm -hmm and therefore they, had, they have to lose. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's all so clear that it is a dis disruptive technology and that it works. But any time you try and introduce a new idea, you know, first it's, it'll never work. Mm -hmm. Then it'll work, but only for a short time. Then the guy's really lucky. And finally, you know, he's right. <laughs> Do you think during the guy's really lucky phase, or is there a phase in there where it is the guy's a threat and we're gonna say whatever we can to confuse people about the solution that he's putting in the market. Well, they can try that, but it's too late for that. It's too late. You know, I, in, in the last five years, roughly, uh, $400 billion has gone out of actively managed funds, and $600 billion has gone into index funds. Uh, it's a trillion dollar swing. Mm. Just for the equity part of the business, it's probably around, I don't know, six or seven trillion. Mm. It's a huge swing in five little years. Mm -hmm. So the market is responding 
uh, the even the people that, that don't like it at all are doing it mm. because the client insists on it. And uh, part of the insistence has gone in the wrong direction. And uh, that is, we have the ETF, which is a way of trading the index fund all day long in real time. Mm -hmm. What kind of a nut would do that? Well, there are a lot of nuts out there, though, right? I mean, even though there's been a tremendous growth in index fund assets, simultaneously, there's been a complete diminishment of long-term investment as a principle that is both um, adhered to by individuals, by professionals, covered in the financial media uh, that way. Um, the average holding period for a stock or a fund or the holdings within an actively managed fund, its turnover ratio is you know, north of 100%. Used to yeah, be, it's actually much higher than that when you look at the cost of it because that's the lesser of portfolio sales and purchases uh, that you count as the, as the amount of turnover and then divided into the assets of the fund. And the fact is, whether it's more or less or even the same, you've got those two sets of transactions. You take money out of a stock, that costs money, and you put money back into another stock, and that costs money. So the costs are very, very high. The unit costs, in fairness, costs for trading a, a share, mm -hmm. used to maybe 30 cents, 25 cents in the old days, mm -hmm. and, and now they're probably less than a penny. Mm -hmm. But if you're trading, I don't know, is there anything? Times, is there anything good about much. anything good about trading, in your opinion? Well, yeah, I think the market needs a certain amount of liquidity, mm -hmm. and I accept that. But how much liquidity do we need? Do we really need the market to turn over 250% a year? Mm -hmm. well, I grew up in this business. There wasn't a liquidity problem. And the turnover was 25% <laughs> a year. But, so I've been known to say, you'll like this expression, uh, taking on or, or, or copying Samuel Johnson on what he said about patriotism. Liquidity is the last refuge of the scoundrel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the scoundrel is transacting that frequently because what's motivating them? It's human nature and they're blind to what they're doing or there's a built-in conflict of interest that's causing a professional to transact either in their retail client accounts or for reasons inside their fund. Well, first, there's a lot of ego out there. Mm -hmm. uh, even someone you know has a pretty big ego, but he doesn't use it on saying I'm smarter than other investors. Mm -hmm. But uh, we all think we're, we're smarter than the other guy. We all think we're better drivers. Sometimes I think we all think we're better lovers. I don't know about that. <laughs> but you know, we're all average. We know that. And uh, have to be and will be. And no Lake Wobegon here in the investment business. And then we have this massive marketing machine of paid salesmen uh, who can always beat the index. Because if you've got a universe of 500 funds and someone says, the index, I want the index because it does better. Your problem is you're looking at the average fund. I will give you a fund that's above average. And uh, it's always easy to do, very easy to do. You know, for some period, for some fund, it's the easiest thing in the world to do. Mm -hmm. So the, the sales machine, uh, and they have conviction they're doing the right thing, but they've got to know deep down they're not doing the right thing. And now, I, there, are, there have to be some that you believe are doing the right thing on the active management side. There have to be some investors that you've encountered over time that you think it's admirable what they're doing and actually the results, so insofar as we can draw a conclusion off of a single sample of one person's lifetime, appear to be above average sustainably. Well, I'm not sure above average is, is quite the standard, and that's a really tough standard to meet. Mm -hmm. But you can do a perfectly good job, uh, and the managers I like, and uh, I, I don't hesitate to say who they are. Uh, you, can, you can look at uh, Dodge and Cox, mm -hmm. uh, and you can look at, um, what the hell is the name of that place, Mike, down there? Longleaf. Longleaf, Longleaf. yeah, love look that. At, you can look at Dodge, I'm gonna clip that out. Oh, you can look well, at, oh, we're gonna know, we're gonna push the volume up on that uh, one. <laughs> and you can look at Longleaf, and, and there are probably a number of other small yeah. firms. Yeah. What is their, uh, what, what is, what's so good about them? They are in the business of investment management and not in the business of marketing. Mm -hmm. This has become a great big marketing business. Mm -hmm. And they stick to their guns and they manage money. They slip, they stumble, they err, they make mistakes. This is a business for all that. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, I would bet on someone whose business is trying to be a professional investor, not a trader, mm -hmm. someone whose business is trying to serve you rather than serve the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So there aren't a lot of them, 
and uh, you know I, I don't want to put a curse on them mm -hmm. because they'll get too big and they won't be able to do it anymore. And that's mm -hmm. still that's a little uh, one of the great secrets of this business, mm -hmm. and that is if you're really good for a long enough time, you draw an awful lot of money, and then you can't be good anymore. Mm -hmm. Too big to succeed. Too big to succeed. Or as Warren says, Warren Buffett says, a fat wallet is the enemy of superior returns. Mm -hmm. And of course it is. So if you can get someone that can give an index a good run for its money, I wouldn't say you're going to do a lot better. I don't think they would say mm -hmm. you're going to do a lot better. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a good alternative because you don't have all this infinite number of choices. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Longleaf probably runs, let me say, four or five funds. Dodge and Cox runs five, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet the rest of us run, Fidelity runs 260 funds. Mm -hmm. Vanguard runs, I think it's around 170, which sure anybody really knows. And uh, that's tough on a whole lot of levels. Can you describe fundamentally how an index fund works? For somebody who is watching and owns a Vanguard index fund, how's the, how does the process work behind the scenes? Is it, is it um, five robots, three, <laughs> three monkeys? And, uh, and a bunch of data, or are there human choices that are going into the index? Well, first, you can, you can match the index in a very casual way. Just, I mean, by, if, if um, I don't know, Microsoft is 2% of the index, you just put 2% of the portfolio in Microsoft. Uh, pretty, and, and then the same thing is true of every other fund. Not very complicated. And if you don't do it with great professional skill, all kinds of quantitative support, you will do a perfectly good job, but not a perfect traffic tracking job. In the long run, mm -hmm. you'll match the index, but you might beat the index by 50 basis points, mm -hmm. half of 1% in a year, mm -hmm. and lose to it by half a percent in another year. The, the tolerance are very small. Mm -hmm. But uh, and people like to see, or investors like to see, a tight tracking. Mm -hmm. And so you do all these quantitative things. They're, they're definitely called for, called for you know, quantitative mathematical skills. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly when there are additions to the index or subtractions. That happens more in the Standard & Poor's 500 than in the total stock market. Uh, but um, it's really, it's a very simple thing conceptually, but to do it with something that approaches perfection is just what you say. A lot of quantitative uh, people hidden behind the, <laughs> hidden behind the walls. If we, if we take the concept of too big to succeed and apply it to capitalization weighted index fund, isn't that a bad idea? Wouldn't it be better to set the index fund up on a different set of criteria rather than weighting it by capitalization? Aren't we buying the largest companies and the most successful companies which have the smallest future market opportunity and, and underweighting the small, potentially upstart, disruptive future vanguards? Well, you're saying that cap weighting indexes are, give you a flawed index in effect. And uh, I guess my first comment would be, uh, since such an index beats the heck out of money managers, uh, what kind of trouble would be would we be in if they if there were a perfect index? <laughs> so, uh, and, and then I'd also say, much more importantly than that, and that is, if the idea of indexing, as Paul Samuelson described it when he wrote the foreword to my first book, uh, was you will uh, get better returns than your neighbors and sleep better than your neighbors, and your neighbors own the capitalization weighted index. Mm -hmm. Now, will a value weighted index do better? Will a dividend weighted index do better? Probably it will do better some of the time. I do not believe it will do better in the long run. That remains to be seen. But you know, when you think about it, uh, if let's say fundamental indexing, whatever that means exactly, but a weighting by some company uh, corporation data rather than by market price, still owns essentially all the stocks that the S&P 500 owns, which is somewhat different weights. Not huge, but somewhat different weights. So uh, they may do better, they may do worse. But if they continue to do better, well, what will happen? Everybody will take their money out of the market-weighted index and put it into the value-weighted index, and then the opportunity will vanish. Hmm. That's the way the markets work. Hmm. I don't think it's gonna work. Hmm. And I don't think that it's worthwhile to add that risk. You know, I know what I can get. I can do better than my neighbors. I can own the whole market. That's a little beyond the S&P, but it's a perfectly way, a good way of looking at it. Uh, do better than my neighbors. And should I give that, let's call it certainty of relative return, up for the uncertainty of whether one of these schemes that's out there, equal weighting, 
value weighting, dividend weighting, fundamental <laughs> weighting, all kinds of weighting. I kind of feel like equal weighting is not would be a, would be a smart, but I guess time will tell whether that. Well, plays it, it works sometimes. We have yeah. data going back forever, but don't let the past data impress you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when people start actually doing these things, you know this from your own experience that what comes out of the lab is seldom represent, reflected in the real world. <laughs> How many mutual funds of, a, of an index variety, let's say somebody's indexing entirely, um, how many funds should they own as an individual? What's too many and what's too few? Well, you can certainly do it with one. Mm -hmm. And that would be something like the Vanguard Balanced Index Fund. Mm -hmm. It's 60% uh, total stock market, 40% mm -hmm. total bond market, both US. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. So a, a person out there could simplify their lives, make sure they're paying off all their high interest debt, it's gone. They're saving a portion of their salary each year, and they're putting it all in the Vanguard Balanced, Balanced Index Fund. Right. And that three-step approach is gonna improve the outcomes for the majority of investors out there, number one, and you think it's completely um, reasonable to put it all in a single fund. Well, I, there are obviously a lot of nuances here, and one of them is, uh, if you're younger, I would think you'd want to be 80 or 85 percent equities. Okay, yeah. And if you're older, I would think, although interest rates are so terrible today, you have to rethink all these things mm -hmm. as the markets change. Mm -hmm. But older, maybe 25 percent mm -hmm. uh, equities and 75 percent bonds, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are this is kind of an age-based. Your bond position should equal your age. Mm -hmm. But that's a rule of thumb. And interestingly enough, it shows a gap in the kind of the way these target date funds are, that are very popular today are structured because they ignore the fact that 85% of their shareholders have social security. Mm -hmm. And a social security, when you begin it, has a capitalized value of maybe the stream of future payments you will get is capitalized at around, let me say, $350,000. Mm -hmm. If you have $350,000 totally invested in an equity index fund, you're 50 50. Mm -hmm. now, you don't look at it that way, mm -hmm. uh, and your behavior mm -hmm. may get you in trouble that way because I got too much in stocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what people should be doing, honestly, Tom, is stop looking at the silly stock market every day and look at the cash flow they get. And in, 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 in a uh, Social Security, those payments are going to continue. They're going to grow with the cost of living. Uh, I'm, I'm certain, as certain as I can be, the Social Security will be repaired simply because it has to be, and I, I don't think its future is in doubt. Mm. If we can just wake up a few of those people down in the nation's capital. Mm. And uh, th for stocks, uh, you probably want to look at more of a dividend bias. You could buy a high yield dividend index instead of the total stock market index if capital flows. Mm. And that dividend, if you look at the stream of dividends, it makes the stock market look violently volatile. The dividend stream goes up, up, up. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is there have only been two significant dividend cuts uh, since 1925. Mm -hmm. One was in 2932, and the other was a few years ago, 2007, 2009, when all the financial companies pretty much eliminated their dividends. Mm -hmm. We've already recovered from that. Mm -hmm. That's over. We're on the S&P. Mm -hmm. Standard & Poor's Index is, is paying more dividend now than it was before the drop. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, all of these things are uh, clear in the past, and in a lot of ways that doesn't matter. But if you assume that American business grows, that America grows, uh, that the dividend stream will keep going up. And as, as uh, people ask all the time, uh, corporations have got huge amounts of cash, mm -hmm. so dividends should not be uh, jeopardized, absent some real problem in the, in the world and in the economy. And people should be aware of that. You know, there's, nothing is a lead pipe cinch in this world, but you have, <laughs> actually, it's sort of amusing. You have a couple of big risks out there. Um, you know, you know about the economy, you know about it, uh, international kind of hanging on by its own. You know about the, do do the dollar, you know about the Federal Reserve buying all those securities and trying to bid the prices up of, of assets, not a particularly wise move. And uh, you have to assess those risks and try to make some kind of a judgment, however difficult about uh, how they come out. But you also have to realize a couple of things. Well, that's the second set of risks is really the incomprehensible risks, like nuclear warfare mm -hmm. or a, a, a meteor. Meteorite hits mm -hmm. the US. Mm -hmm. Well, or robots 
robots, robots begin anything. to control our society. It, 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 it won't matter whether you have stocks or bonds or anything else. So, club, yeah. you'll need a club. Yeah, yeah just, just yeah. a club. So there are all kinds of big and small risks. Yeah. But as I've often said, uh, you know, we're sitting here knowing where the world is going into a, the hell in a handbasket. Uh, but people have been worried about that since the beginning. The knowns are not the, yeah, the, the known fears are not the ones to yeah. really, really fear. And so, so are you, and by the way, Jack, I, I truly can't believe that you're 84 years old. Are you 84% in bonds? Uh, no. Okay. No. Yeah. So you're violating your advice. Well, yeah, I actually, I'm kidding. Well, to be honest, by rule of thumb. <laughs> yeah. And of course, at 84, your Social Security doesn't have a capitalized value of $350,000 either. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like the next check to come in. My wife doesn't think we should take the checks, but you know we postponed them until we were 70. Mm. And we really got a nice, I can live on what I get from Social Security, because mm -hmm. <laughs> we live in a fairly modest way, mod well, modest by the standards, of, very modest compared by the standards of what you see in the financial world and mm -hmm. corporate world. But uh, pretty, pretty nice compared to the typical American mm -hmm. worker. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it, you, know, you start with a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you work back for... And you work back, and then you got to think about it. And I don't know, I haven't figured out, Tom, how to do it, but when I first introduced this rule, I can remember back in 1999 at Morningstar, uh, I told them that I was uh, reducing my uh, equity position from about 75% of, of my holdings to, I think, 30% of my holdings. Uh, because the stock market was selling at 35 times earnings, and the bond market was yielding 7%. And I looked at the transcript a while back, and I said, you know, honestly, when I look at the math, I don't see why, anybody hold, why I would hold any stocks at all, because at 30 times, 35 times earnings, mm -hmm. stocks were not going to give you a 7% return in the first decade of the 20th century. But now you look at the numbers and you're not really sure what to do about them. Well, now, you know, my own position is that stocks are more or less fairly valued, probably a little on the high side, but, you know, more like, depending on whose number you're using, 15 to 17 times earnings, maybe 18 times earnings. Mm -hmm. It's a long way from 35, half. And bonds are not yielding seven. They're yielding, depending on what you want to look at, 3%, 2.5%, mm -hmm. 3.5%, depending on corporate government mix, maturities and things of that nature. So you have to think a little bit differently. But I have not done anything about that. I, am, I don't change my portfolio. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to um, talk a little bit about financial advice and how that side of the business works because Vanguard um, has, is at least perceived to, to be exclusively a mutual fund company. So a lot of individuals are trying to figure out how to put a portfolio together. It's helpful to hear the number of funds that you would put into a an account for an individual and it's relatively small and should be manageable and decision that an individual can make on their own. But yet many people come to their finances and say, you know, please, Jack, just just, just do it for me. Like, I'll, I'll literally give you the authority to make all transactions in my account. I don't want to know anything about it, which of course sets up a lot of people to be taken advantage of by, by financial advisors. So what, what do you think of the financial advice side of, of the, um, decision-making well, process for well, an individual. Well, first, uh, let me just take this, maybe you think it's kind of a nuance, but uh, I got a letter from a shareholder the other day saying, you keep telling me you only need three or four funds, why do you have 170? And I took the simple example for him. We have like 60 bond funds, 60. Why is that? Well, we, for, we invented or created or developed a system of you tell us the maturity, how much risk and how much income you want. So you get short, medium, and long, and also a couple of variations around that. And then in the municipal area, you only have the funds themselves, but you do in different states. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. then we got some bond index funds, and we probably have 60 bond funds mm -hmm. out there. So an investor either has to know and uh, you know, do the math, should he be in municipal bonds or in, uh, in uh, taxable bonds? Mm -hmm. Very important decision. And right now, municipal bonds look very attractive simply on the numbers, those kind of numbers. Mm -hmm. And then you have to decide how you want to balance risk and return. Obviously, the highest, the higher yields, no matter how depressed they are, are in long bonds, but the greatest risk is there. Mm -hmm. And the lowest yield is in short, but the, 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 the greatest principal stability is there. 
So those are decisions investors really have to think a little bit about. Mm -hmm. It's not just, I mean, you, buy, you can buy the bond index to be sure, and that turns out to be an intermediate term bond fund, in mm -hmm. fact, mm -hmm. and that's perfectly satisfactory. But the, you know, we kind of nuanced ourselves to death a little bit, and uh, you know, you don't, you should, in terms of taxable and tax exempt, uh, deal with that issue. Mm -hmm. And I'd say to simplify, most investors should be in tax exempt, mm -hmm. uh, just because the, 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 they yield significantly more than treasuries, uh, even before you take account the tax exemption. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think they're attractive, and maybe you want some treasuries there as your bulwark, and you can buy a treasury bond fund, and it gets to be a little nuanced. Mm -hmm. I think the interesting question is, if you want financial advice, how much should you pay for it? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, let me give you an interesting little piece of math. I look at the stock market investment return as a 2% dividend yield at the present time, low but not nearly as low as the 1% we want, and a 5% earnings growth. That's a 7% investment return, and over the next 10 years, I don't think it's going to go up because of higher PEs. Mm -hmm. We're down because of lower PEs, not down much anyway. And uh, so there won't be any speculative return, by my reckoning. Mm -hmm. So we've got 7%. Mm -hmm. That's nominal. Uh, and so we go to real. And if we're lucky enough to get 2% inflation, that's 5. And a typical fund manager is taking 2. That's 3. And if you give a, if you give a of 1% to an investment advisor, that's a third of three, and you're down to two. And uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you're a fund picker, you, use, you lose around 2% by jumping on the latest bandwagon. And 2% two, 2 minus two is a number that I won't recalculate for your audience. <laughs> and well, it's a reminder of Warren Buffett saying that the financial services industry is an extractive. Sure. We call it, the economists call it rent-seeking industry. Of course it is. It has to be. And it has to shrink, and it has to get its cost down, the trading volume has to come down, and a lot of mutual funds are going to have to fight. They're going to be cash cows. The big mutual fund companies are fantabulously profitable, mm -hmm. and uh, they can't change what they're doing and do what we do, because they would not be profitable to their owners, mm -hmm. either financial conglomerates or all those partners at Capital Group or the Johnson family up at Fidelity. I mean, their, their wealth is like 20 billion or something, putting the family all together. They've done great in this business. Whether their shareholders have done great is the question that interests me. That's where we should be focused. And the financial conglomerates, the same thing. They basically tried to destroy this industry. Uh, they own 30 of the 40 large, uh, 40 of the 50, 40 of the 50 largest fund groups are, are publicly held. And most of 30, 30 of them by financial conglomerates. And think about buying a fund that's run by a financial conglomerate. Why did they buy their way into this industry? And why the are there Galconda, more funds? The Golconda. They wanted to jump on the wealth bandwagon of managing money. And they will accomplish that, whether by hook or by crook. If their return capital threshold is, uh, is at 15% and they pay a billion dollars uh, for a mutual fund company, they're going to have to take out $150 million a year. And it's easy. Uh, all kinds of things you can do to make you're, it. You're a fan of capitalism. Um, so if we look in the marketplace in finance and compare two actors out on the stage, one of them is a fee-only fiduciary financial planner with a basic flat fee dollar amount that sits down and builds a Vanguard-based index low-cost portfolio acting as a fiduciary. The other is a financial advisor or broker um, I'm reminded of three that came to a book signing in, our, in San Diego years ago of ours and said, you know, you talk about the Vanguard Index Fund, it's really funny to say that. We now manage money. We've left the firm that we were at. In, in their case, they were at Merrill. And they said, we couldn't own, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't sell the index fund to our clients because we couldn't make any money on it. But we all owned it ourselves. So it's almost the, it's the complete reversal of the fiduciary. It's like, I'm, I will be fiduciary for myself. And then fiduciary with my relationship with you is, hey, if you buy it, if you're willing to buy what I'm selling, then I haven't done anything that I should feel badly about. So the reality, though, in the marketplace is that the first actor, the fee-only financial fiduciary, is living a relatively lean you know, existence in terms of the financial makeup. And the VP of the big investment firm has a country house, is making a million dollars a year selling load funds 
and a whole bunch of booby traps in the portfolio to keep you locked into different products. So how do you, how do you observe and what conclusions do you draw about capitalism given that? Given that? Well, capitalism is, is very funny, has a very funny manifestation when you get to the fiduciary duty of managing other people's money. You know, it, it, the, most systems, particularly when you begin with a new idea, for example, uh, if you want to get it sold, you pay the salesman a lot of money, you advertise a lot, and you deliver 70 cents in the dollar or something like that. In, in an investment business, the investment business is really a, uh, a business of sort of mathematical candor. You can't hide. You know, if you're selling a Mercedes-Benz, the salesman is selling it, he's going to say, look at the value you're going to get. Your neighbors are going to be envious, blah, 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 whatever it is. And you'll like the diesel fuel or the door slams nicely or it's got a great sound system or with air conditioning, I don't know what. Uh, but in the financial business, value is one thing, dollars. It can be measured, unlike all these esoteric things that characterize capital. And once you get to measuring value, the problem becomes a very simple mathematical problem. Now, how do you get people to focus on that is a good question. How do you get them to focus on the role of cost in that is a good question. How do you get them to think about the long term? Because in two or three or four years, the difference in cost, let's face it, just doesn't matter. But over your investment lifetime, getting the market return in an index fund or almost the full market return, compared to paying 2%, which is roughly the right number for, for a managed fund, uh, means that you get, in the latter case, about 30 cents in the dollar that you get from the end of 30 cents. But you've got to look at 40 or 50 years. But these young people today, say they're 25, 50 years is 75. That's too short. They'll live to 95. They should be looking at 70 years. And these numbers just get further and further apart. So, you know, you do need, a lot of people need help. There's no question about that. Uh, but I think we have to rethink how we pay for that help. You know, maybe the 1% is much too high. Uh, all at 1%, if, if you have a client with $25,000, 1% probably isn't nearly enough. So I think eventually you'll have a fee-for-service kind of thing, like a like typical professional service, lawyers, accountants, and so on. Neither profession of which I'm like particularly smitten with, uh, the uh, have gone that way. And that's the way they conduct their business, and it's it's more of a professional approach than a biz business approach. But don't try and get me to tell you there are easy answers to this. Mm -hmm. You need help out there. People need their hands held. There's no question about that. And uh, paying a little bit for it is probably better than doing nothing and mm -hmm. uh, just trying to do it yourself. And the worst thing of all is not investing at all. Mm -hmm. That is the one guarantee we have in the financial business. Well, we are actually two. One is if you buy the index fund, you'll get the market return. And guarantee two is if you don't invest, you will get nothing. Uh, one of our members, Neil, wants to know what you think of, well, let's take the, uh, the family that I was raised in, which taught us from a relatively early age to buy stocks directly. Um, I'll make the argument on behalf of it. And then Neil wants to know what you think of that argument, where you see strengths and weaknesses to it, and feel free to knock it down entirely. You'll just be knocking my my whole life to the ground if you do. Oh, would I really be doing that? <laughs> no. Um, so we were raised in a family and taught to invest in stocks. Um, it was a low cost alternative, a, a one time payment. And we were taught to, I guess one of the primary pieces of advice I give to any investor who's buying stocks is double your hold, holding period right now. And, and if, if, you, if you want to do it right after you've done that, it's great, double it again. Because um, just as with a great fund, a great business should be held over at least five years to really see the value of that organization play out in the marketplace. So we were taught to buy stocks, the low cost, one-time transaction, find the great businesses with a great leader um, who's Howard Schultz has been in Starbucks, you know, it's, uh, John Mackey at Whole Foods. These businesses have compounded incredible returns since they came public 20 years ago. And, you know, hitch your wagon to the stars of these really great, often consumer facing businesses that we can follow. Have to do a lot of numerical work and valuation, et cetera. But that's how we've been building our portfolios in our family. And so our perspective is, and Neil wants to know, what, what do you as a, when, when is it appropriate in your opinion for an individual to buy stocks? Is there a, a level of expertise or interest, a, an amount of time you should have or capital, or it should be a, a side frivolity in, in, in a base portfolio of index funds, et cetera? That, that last sentence captures it best, and that is you should have a serious money account, 
I might even call it a boring money account, where you put money in the stock market index fund and balance it out a little bit with some bonds, depending on age and so on. And don't look at it. Don't look at it for 50 years. Don't peak. But when you retire, open the envelope. Be sure a doctor is nearby to revive you. <laughs> <laughs> You'll go into a dead faint. You can't believe there's that much money in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's where we fool ourselves. So that's a serious money, boring money account. We have a gambling culture here in this country. Maybe every country does. You see it in its finest manifestation, or maybe I should say worst manifestation, in the lottery, mm -hmm. state lottery. Uh, Las Vegas contributes its share. Uh, the racing, the races contribute their share, the track, and all these are just gambling, mm -hmm. uh, where you know, a whole lot of people bet their money, and a whole lot of people take their money out, and the croupier wins. Three, wins. three to twenty percent of yeah, whatever is whatever been bet. It is. You put a dollar in, you're um, gonna lose. So, uh, I'd say have a funny money if, if you if you have the gambling instinct, and most people do. At least start off. I mean, I'd say start off with an index fund, period, and for five years don't do anything else, and then look around and see what's happened in the five years. See how it felt when the market dropped fifty percent. See how it felt when it came back. <coughs> and those five year periods are going to be very different for one investor and another. But because uh, they're all, you know, over time. But um, then, when you get there, five percent in the funny money account. What would have happened to Warren Buffett if he had done that? He would have a uh, tremendous <laughs> amount of value would not have been created by his 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 understanding and ability to evaluate a business for investment. Well, name two. <laughs> <laughs> well, Longleaf. You mentioned Longleaf, Dodge well, and Cox. Well, they, they don't have the sensational returns. They may probably have something above par returns, but maybe a little bit below par from time to time. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then don't forget in Warren's case, he wasn't running a mutual fund. Mm -hmm. The mutual fund is a badly structured business for investment management. We say, and this is the way it has to be really, you can take your money out whenever you want, and you gotta be ready to put it in whenever you want. And so you ride on these waves of optimism and good performance, and the money comes in up here, and then reversion to the mean, which is a big part of my recent book, a big part of the final chapter of my recent book, called Clash of the Cultures, and it's happened everywhere. It's happened in Magellan Fund. It's happened in T. Rowe Price Growth Fund. It's happened in our old IVEST Fund. It's happened in Fidelity Trend Fund, Ned, which Ned Johnson happened to have run. It happened in CGM. All the hot funds, they're all in there for the last 25 years, and they all look like this. Mm. You lap, put them over each other, mm. looks like the Himalaya Mountains. Mm -hmm. The reversion to the mean is a, a constant pattern. For the individual, um, I'm just going to poke around here a little bit just to get your full philosophy. For the individual, it's unlikely that you're going to hit the mountaintop of the Himalayas with your portfolio. So you may not have to ever see the other side of the mountaintop unless you have so successfully invested that your personal account is. Yeah, well, moving the up in a, a billion-dollar. Let's, let's say you asset. bought Magellan before you, before it was for sale, which is where that record begins. By the way, there's a lot of phoniness in this business, uh, and uh, you. But you're, you're going to enjoy the mountain, mm -hmm. and you're not going to know it's a mountain. Mm -hmm. But when that mountain gets up there, you think, "My God, this! I found the holy grail." Now I'm really going to go all in. And now I'm going to go all out. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of behavioral kind of stuff. Not mm -hmm. to use too fancy a word, uh, in the mutual fund industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, Tom. There is no behavioralism in the field of stocks generally. How could that be? That is because I'm a dumb behavior. The guy that buys my stock from me is a smart behavior. We offset each other. I mean, it's not as if I, I, it's not as if I can make a behavioral mistake uh, without somebody else making a, 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 a successful behavior thing, the other side of the trade. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think we take a lot for granted. We listen to all these theories and Big, old, boring indexing is the answer. Have you ever bought individual stocks and or actively traded funds? And if so, what do you look for in those investments? Well, I, when I came into the business, I had friends in the brokerage business. I bought this and that and the other thing. And then I had a broker. And he would tell me this was good, get out of that and get into that. And it wasn't that they did badly, which was, of course, what they did. But it was, I just couldn't stand to have my phone ring when I was trying to do my work. So I haven't owned an individual stock since, let me say, 1960. I don't know exactly, a long, long time. Uh, I've never bought anybody else's is mutual fund. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, although I did buy a, like a nice uh, backup investment for my son John's, John Bogle's fund, mm -hmm. Bogle, I guess Bogle Small Cap Growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you know, I did that and it's done actually rather nicely, of course. He's very smart. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's about it. Even the um, most successful actively traded funds at Vanguard have a period of three years, sometimes even five years, where they underperform. But net net, they've outperformed. If in in the case of outperforming actively managed funds, that let's just say they have a few qualities that we probably both love: very low turnover, sustain you know um, uh, tenured leadership, a very fundamental businessly analytical approach. Um, but even in those cases where the fund is very well run, or even uh, the Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are going to have a year, a period of a couple of years, potentially, where they lose to the market, what's the appropriate amount of time to hold something before saying, this, this team doesn't really know what they're doing? Well, let me start off with, uh, I should explain Vanguard's philosophy as I implemented it, not as they necessarily do today. And that is very early, after we closed Windsor Fund back in 1985, it was getting too big. And we started Windsor too, and everybody said it would never do nearly as well as Windsor, and of course it's done better a little. They, they track each other very closely, so I don't want to make an issue about that. And then we had U.S. Growth, and uh, that was run by Wellington. We decided we needed a new manager, and I wasn't so sure about them, so I did what set the standards for everything we did since we, everything I did since then, and that is bring in another manager, and then another manager, and then another. So we have a lot of equity funds that have five managers. It's not that it's easy to pick five managers, but if you're comparing yourself with the universe of, let me say, large cap value funds, and there are 50 funds in that universe, five is gonna have the same return. It's kind of a law of large numbers thing. So most of our equity funds have five to seven managers. Mm -hmm. So there's not much premium on manager selection. Mm -hmm. You hope they will do well. We're having to have a good year, have, be having a good year this year. But we'll have a bad one because that's the nature of the business. Mm -hmm. What you don't want is something that is so departing, departs so far from the market, particularly on the upside. You don't like it on the downside, but on the upside, it draws money in. It brings in these investors who are looking for the next big thing, the next hot thing. So, um, and we win by about a point and a half a year on average, on average not because we pick better managers, because we have very low operating costs, our expense ratio. We negotiate the fees way down with the advisors, the fee rates, because the advisors are not starving to death in terms of the dollar fees. And then we've looked, as you said, for long-term managers uh, with lower turnover, and then we have no loads. So if you look at all those numbers, if we're good enough to be average, or lucky enough to be average, we win by about a point and a half a year, which is 20% over 10 years. And I always thought that was quite good enough. Awesome. Is there ever, just a few more questions, is there ever a situation that you can imagine where an individual should own a load fund? Uh, they've sat down with a financial advisor and now they're watch this video and they're looking through their portfolio as we're talking and they see a number of funds that their advisor has put them in that carry a load. Is there ever a situation they should be happy about that? I'd say unequivocally not. Uh, you know, you can look back, the advisor's gonna say you a load fund. He says, this no load stuff is bunk. Here's the no load, here's the no load index. And this fund, even counting the 5% commission, which is roughly where they are today, although a lot of that has changed to advisory fees. And uh, even with that 5% commission, we did 50% better. Well, hindsight is always 2020. If they can't find a fund that beat the index, I don't know, they can't be very acute. They can't be paying much attention. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. But don't believe it, the past is not prologue. And actually, if you look at the numbers carefully enough and long enough and thoughtfully enough, you'll see the past performance of a fund is anti-prologue. The better it is in the past, the more the regression to the mean is gonna be, the greater that's gonna be in the future. Do you believe that we will have a unified fiduciary standard or not? Are you optimistic about that? Uh, Maybe an explain, I mean, I think we've explained what it is for some. Well, they, they, let me just say this. The, the issue is a very narrow issue at the moment, and that is the fiduciary standard for people who are selling funds, investment advisors, fee-only investment advisors, stockbrokers, things like that. It's, 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 a, it's a firing line level. I think we are making a very big mistake. I've written to the SEC three times about this. 
And that is the biggest problem of the fiduciary side is on the fund manager side. And we need a federal standard of fiduciary duty for fund managers. And if you look at what's going on at the Labor Department, and I've talked to them down there about this, uh, you looked at the, uh, the a fiduciary duty for the corporation and for the evaluator and for this one and that one, but no fiduciary duty for the guy where well, you really need the fiduciary duty, the fund manager. Mm -hmm. So we do need fiduciary duty. That would tend to get us out of this morass we're in of short-term trading, of high costs, of speculation versus long-term investment because it's the antithesis of trading. And it would probably eliminate the conflict of interest that is obvious if um, your fiduciary has two sets of fiduciary duties. One is fiduciary duty to the mutual funds, mm -hmm. and the other is fiduciary duty to the shareholders of his publicly held company or publicly held conglomerate. That fiduciary duty is, those two fiduciary duties are in direct conflict. And so we, of course, quote the Bible. No man can serve two masters. And then we add to that what Matthew said right after that, uh, or Matthew quoted the Lord as saying right after that, I suppose. And that is, for he will hate the one and love the other. Now, in this business, who pays the portfolio managers? Who makes all the money? Who has all the public stockholders? The manager gets all the love. And I won't say they hate the shareholders, I wouldn't say that at all, but they love the managers more. Um, I want to just talk in the end a little bit about the fact that you've been a business leader. We talk about investments, but you started a company and ran that business, and it has $2 trillion in assets today and 14,000 employees. It's a massive, I mean, sure, it's way beyond what you would have dreamed of in 1974, Correct. although I'm sure you were optimistic about it your chances it could be given the solution you'd created, but how do you, how do you evaluate talent, the people that you work with? Um, you know, what, what, were, what were some of the cultural features of Vanguard during your leadership? Well, one of them is exemplified by a story I tell about the time we got to around 200 employees. And I think, you know, we really ought to have a personnel department human resources is called now. Seems like a good idea. And I was you know, really a dictator. So I looked around and tried to see who was not busy in the office. We we're very strapped for being able to spend any money. And there was a secretary in the legal department, a very lovely woman. And I talked to our lawyer. We had one lawyer then. We have 140 now. This is called Progress. Uh, and uh, I said, you know, could I use her to run a little uh, personnel effort, interview people? And uh, he said, yeah, I think she can do that. So she goes into my office. I'd like you to do this. Whatever you want, Mr. Bogle. So we talked a little bit, and she started to go out of the office. And she was about to walk out the door. And he turned around and came back in. And she said, you know, I want to do whatever you want me to do, Mr. Bogle. But I don't know what it is you want me to do. And I said, well, I'm not sure I know either. This is what happens when you're a very small company. And I got, had a lot of things on my mind, of course. And I said, I don't know what it is uh, that I want you to do, but let's start with this. Hire nice people, and then make sure that they hire nice people. Mm -hmm. And that's the best I can do on this. You know, most of the jobs at Vanguard, some of the technology jobs are, require a whole lot of professional skill. Most jobs can be done by intelligent human beings with a little experience and a motivation to do them. So I look at Vanguard as not being some, you know, can we hire the best and the brightest? I mean, that's a, that's a big universe, and we probably have our share of them. Uh, but you try and get people that you can work with, that can work well with others. Um, they're going to maybe try and not make the same mistakes you did. Uh, but it's you know, the change from a little tiny organization, a little embryonic organization, uh, where there is a captain and the rest of the oarsmen <laughs> down below <laughs> <laughs> on the galley. Uh, and uh, that's obviously oversimplified. But um, we were very, our mission is very simple. Uh, our, our presentation is very simple. When you think of what we can, what we can uh, explain to people what they should do in investing, 
It's right out of the proverbial horn book, the ABCs of the old days. And uh, it works, it's understandable, and is guaranteed to give you your fair share of whatever returns the stock and bond markets are generous enough to give, give us or mean enough to take away from us. There's a Gallup survey that shows that seven out of 10 people going to work in America today basically say that they're indifferent or even downright negative about the organization they're working for. Um, so in a funny way, in that, in that rowboat scenario where we're all rowing together in many organizations, more than half of the people don't even really care about what they're doing. Well, so obviously we, you've found people who are passionate about the principles. Yeah, we, have more, we have more turnover than I would like, but you know, that happens at kind of these middle grade job levels. Our people are well paid, they've got terrific benefits for partnership plans that they share in the earnings we generate for shareholders. And I still spend uh, an hour with each Award for Excellence winner, the a program I put in there all those years ago. Uh, and there are probably about eight a quarter. So I get to sit down and talk to eight people a quarter. It may not sound like much in, the, in an organization that big. 32 a year, 320 in 10 years, 640 in 20 years. So I feel I have a pretty good, now these are exceptional people, that's why they got the Award for Excellence. So I'm not kidding myself. But we have human conversations, uh, talk about commitment, talk about opportunity, talk about the lack of opportunity talk about anything they want to talk about. And uh, they're, they're among the most engaging and pleasant moments of my career. Mm. Um, you're in the unique position of having started, run the company, and now sit as an observer of your creation. Um, succession is such a big issue for so many. We have a lot of business, small business owners that are at the Molly Fool and thinking about that. What, what have you learned or what do you think about? I mean, you're in, in a very, I think in a very, I find it to be a very a great thing that you have minor lovers' quarrels with things that are happening at the company that you created, which I think is a intellectually stimulating must be for you and for the organization to think. And and so how is that experience for you? Well, it's difficult. Let me be honest about it. It's difficult. Uh, the uh, I've had to fall back. I'm, the company is not particularly smitten with my uh, directness and outspokenness in my books, uh, and. Uh, so people don't like criticism, generally speaking, but I'm just trying to tell it the way I see it. And uh, I'd say my book, The Clash of the Cultures, almost entirely reads like a great big commercial for Vanguard, but there's some, some things they don't like in there. Mm -hmm. Talking about the Wellington Fund fee increase, which I was un believe was unjustified. Talking about our proxy voting policies. Talking about the uh, possibility of having a, a transaction tax and a bunch of other things that are, that are similar to that. And uh, so I finally had to develop a response. And when someone says, well, I understand you disagree with Vanguard at that point, I said, absolutely not. I would never disagree with Vanguard. Vanguard disagrees <laughs> with me. <laughs> so, um, and it's their right. Mm -hmm. So you're optimistic about what Vanguard will become over the next 100 years? That, well, that the, I mean, well, where you are, I mean, I, you have to be optimistic. I mean, there are things, risks out there. Will they ever try and demutualize the company? That has happened in a lot of places. I don't think it can happen there, but anything can happen in this world when you get human beings involved. Uh, I think it's important, uh, even as we maintain the letter uh, or the implementation of a mutual structure, we have to maintain the spirit of that mutual structure too. And that requires some doing. Uh, you've got to keep your mind on the mission, that your mission is to serve day after day after day. Uh, it's very difficult to see anything that can get in the way of that except some massive thing like a huge stock market collapse. It would not be good for us. Uh, and uh, every once in a while we depart some of these new funds. I have a little question mark about you know, you must be betting they're better than an index fund. I wouldn't even look. I just say I bet they're not, uh, because nothing can be in the long run. So, you know, I watch. Uh, I think uh, people at Vanguard really. I don't want to overdo this, but I think they love me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a normal human being, uh, more or less normal anyway, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I'm straightforward. They, they can identify with that, and uh, you know, even the people that have been there for a very short period of time seem seem to know who I am. It's, it's total authenticity, 
which means sometimes we'll agree, sometimes we won't agree. Yeah. It's, it's a member of ours named Vicky was bringing up the importance of skin in the game. It's you've had skin in the game with the business and have your capital with the Vanguard funds uh, to this day. Mm -hmm. So the mix of those qualities, um, even though it may lead to some public disagreement, is overall a benefit to both the organization, to you, and to the outcome for the customers of that. Yeah, I really don't care who benefits or who doesn't benefit. I have to tell it as I see it. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to do that for a long, long time. It was key to Vanguard's, well, actually Vanguard going into business. You know, you walk a road that you think is the right, right road. You walk it as straight as you can. You'd be as honest as you can. Uh, I've gotten so, I find confessing my mistakes, which the number in my career, well, I don't even want to get into hundreds, thousands, I don't know how many I've made, infinite maybe numbers of career. It's kind of liberating mm -hmm. to say, I really blew that one. Mm -hmm. And I blew a lot of stuff. But the underlying thesis, if you will, the underlying concept the underlying idea of owning the market, whatever the market may be, and, and getting your fair share has worked and will work. Who else can say that about what's going on in their own company? Small failures all the way to great success. Yeah. Um, my final question, um, how are you spending your time now? I mean, an, an incredible part of your story, which we haven't talked about, but when we've talked to you on the radio, about you know your, your human heart. How old is your heart right now? Well, my heart is, um, I got it when it was 26, and I've had it for almost 18 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're, you're younger than I am. 42, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm starting to feel a little more like 84. <laughs> and you know, the, the, the trail in, in recent years has been a little difficult, uh, physical trail. I've had some very profoundly serious problems, uh, long hospitalizations. But you know, you go into them optimistically. Uh, you get out of my wife is a powerful support, and my kids are wonderful. And uh, you get over the bumps, you're always optimistic. You know, the idea when you go into a hospital again is you, they put you down on the gurney and you just go, here we go again. And uh, like the whole business of the transplant, uh, my, my reaction is just the same, Tom. If I thought jumping up and down on the kitchen table and screaming and yelling about the unfair fairness of life would help my condition, I would do it. <laughs> but it occurs to me it would make it even worse. So you kind of go along, uh, you speak out with honesty. I mean, I'm not trying to say something to hurt somebody, but I'm, I'm not going to agree with something I don't agree with. And uh, you know, I think I think Vanguard it, it, it benefits from that immensely. You know, the shareholders, still close to a lot of them, still got a lot of correspondence, still writing a lot. Um, I have an article about to come out in the Journal of Portfolio Management, another article about to come out in the Financial Analyst Journal. I'll forward to a book about Paul Cabot, one of the founders of the industry I wrote the forward to, and a book about John Maynard Keynes, published by, I think it's Oxford University Press, and which I write the final chapter called Adam Smith and Capitalism. And uh, so, and I, oh, I did a forward for John Wasik's book mm -hmm. on Keynes, uh, John Maynard Keynes as an investor. Mm -hmm. So great I got guess. Keynes, I got Adam Smith, I've got one of the industry's founders, uh, I've got two academic articles, and I'm starting to worry that I'm going to run out of things to do. I don't think that's possible, Jack. <laughs> and you know, anytime you need any extra work that you'd want to do, just come hang out with fools. <laughs> okay. Well, you've been a good fool, Tom. Well, it all started with Bogle's Folly. So yeah. there is... <laughs> we're, we're associated. Uh, we're bound by name. Yeah. But Jack Bogle, thank you so much for taking time. And it's, it's, uh, we could continue this conversation for another hour, but let's let you get on with your day. And we tire. <laughs> we tire. Thanks, Thanks Jack. Thanks, Tom, very much.